Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the 84th live program on orthopedic principles. This time we have Dr. Abdullah Noam from the United Kingdom to talk on knee biomechanics with respect to the fellowship exam. Dr. Hanon is known for his FRCS teaching programs and he's based at Manchester in the United Kingdom. Over to you, Dr. Hanon. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I hope you, I hope you are keeping safe in these circumstances. Um, thank you, Dr. Kopelan, uh, for inviting me to this uh, exciting group. And I'm uh, really privileged to be uh, a member here. Uh, my talk today is about knee biomechanics for the FRCS. It can be a challenging topic, and I certainly myself struggled with it for my exam. Um, but I am going to try and keep it to the exam level, nothing very deep. Initially, the plan was to go for knee biomechanics for both knees, sorry, for biomechanics for both knees and hips, but I thought that it will take a lot of time. So I've started this with the basics of uh, biomechanics, followed by how we apply it to the knee replacement and the native knee. Uh, let's start with a, um, here you go, sorry, some declaration, a legal bit first. So I have no conflict of interest uh, to declare and there are no financial gains from this. The important bit is all the information I am providing is for educational purposes, and these are my understanding of the topic. You are encouraged, in fact, expected to check every bit of detail I am giving you against reputable, reliable resources and form your own opinions because we are all humans and it's a big task for you to put a patient at risk or pass your, you know, go for the exam just based on what you hear in any topic, in any uh, talk. Without further ado, let's start with basic biomechanics. So I will start with basic definitions and I will skip through them. All these are things that have been asked in the exam before. A lot of this is asked in the basic science, but at any stage during the uh, adult pathology, you are expected to justify your answer based on basic science, which means even those can creep in the adult pathology or even trauma um, station. So first of all, what's the difference between kinematics and kinetics? So kinematics is when you study the motion of the object, how it goes and put formulas to describe its motion, regarding, regardless of the forces causing this motion. Kinetics, on the other hand, is when you study the forces causing these and balance them to study how they are affecting the motion. Force is any interaction between two objects, a push or a pull, that can change and result in the change of velocity or direction of one of these objects. The basic unit is one newton, which is the force required to give one kilogram of mass an acceleration of one meter per square second. There are two types of uh, quantities. You've got the vector quantity and scalar quantities. The vector quantity is a quantity that has a mass, sorry, a, a, a quantity in addition to a magnitude. Examples are forces and velocities. The scalar quantities, on the other hand, are just numbers, like the person's height or mass. Moment or torque is a force applied off center, and that results in the object rotating around an axis. If you look at the graph here on the right hand side, you see the difference between applying the force bang in the center, which results in shift in the direction, so either forward or backwards, or we need to apply it off center, which results in rotating. Okay, so the moment or torque is perpendicular to the, you calculated by calculating the perpendicular line to the center of the uh, object multiplied by the distance. The instant center of rotation is the point about which the joint rotates. And this can change as we are going to see uh, when applied to the knee. Another thing that is really basic, and we've studied that in our physics, is Newton's laws. Again, you, you may be asked about them to justify some of your answers. Um, I'm not going to go into huge details about it. 
So the first law, we all know that an object, a static object will remain static, a movable object, a mo mobile object will remain, will remain moving in a straight line at the same speed unless a force uh, causes it to change that. The second law uh, m calculates the force by multiplying the mass by the acceleration. And the third law, which we will have an application for it in a second, um, when two objects exert force on each other, each one of them is exerts the same force on the other object, but on opposite direction. The equation for it is F2 equals minus F1, minus to indicate the direction. As we said, this is a vector. The application of it in our body is the joint reaction force. And it's very important to understand this when you are going to go for a free body diagram equation. And the joint reaction forces is the force that the joint pushes back all the forces applied to it to neutralize it. And the condition for that is it has to be in equilibrium. It, the joint has to stay still. During that moment, all the forces are equal and in opposite direction. So the weight of the person is applied down and the joint reaction force is applied up. And because they are equal, the joint is static or stable. A third point is the lever arms. Um, there are, as you know, three types of lever arms depending on where the fulcrum, the load, and the resistance or the applied force is. So the first type, is when the fulcrum is in the middle between the applied force and the load. Type two is when the fulcrum is one side and the, and the load is in the middle. And the third type is when the fulcrum is at the end and the uh, applied force is in the middle. And these are body examples of these. And again, you are expected to give examples of these in the exam. Try and understand them and when you do, that is the basics for all the free body diagrams. So I'm not going to talk in details about free body diagram, but it is suffice to say that free body diagram is changing the joint into a lever system that you recognize and then applying the forces to that. So whatever joint you are given, try and change it into a free body, uh, sorry, when you ask about a free body diagram, simplify it into a lever system and then apply the forces. Equation, the basic equation to calculate the forces about a, leave, about a lever is the distance from the uh, fulcrum multiplied by the force applied on each direction. And in equilibrium, these are equal, meaning that the two sides are the same. So, moving on to different types of movements, there are, in general, three types of movement. There is rotational movement, sliding movements, and rolling movements, as it applies to joints. For simplification, let's describe the two sides of this joint as a ball and a socket, just for simplification. So the ball, as you can see, is the gray uh, thing on top, and the socket, I will call it, which is the ground on this diagram. So the rotation first, which is, can be rotation along a middle axis or rotation along a horizontal axis. In both points, what is the important bit which we need to look at is the contact point from each side. So if you look at the top left corner, this one here, it is rotating around an axis in the middle. So contact point, the ball, changing. Contact point in the socket is static. It's the same, which means the forces going through the socket point of contact is significant over the life of the joint. Moving to the second type of rotation, if you look at the spin, so it is turning in the horizontal plane. So you can see that the contact point in the ball is the same the contact side, uh, point of the socket is the same. Again, that means that the contact forces, the forces applied to this point is significant throughout the life of the joint. Moving to the next top right. Slide movement, however, it is when you drag an object over a surface. 
So, contact point on the ball is static, it's the same. But you've got, you look and the contact point on, this, on the uh, uh, socket is different, it is changing. So again, the ball here is receiving significant forces through the same point, which means that it will wear faster. The best type of movement is what you can see at the right corner in the bottom. Contact point is changing for both the ball and the socket. This is a smooth movement, there is less drag, and the joint lasts longer. Why am I pointing this types of movement? Because it has an application in the knee. Going back to three body diagram, as I mentioned earlier, it is a simplification of the joint to try and understand all the forces going through it and the amount of force going through the joint. The more force there is through the joint, the faster the wear. Okay. Way to do it is, as I described earlier, you change it into a lever and then you study the vectors. Now, vectors, you draw them as they are applied in the same direction. To resolve the equation, either you put it as an equation using the angles or you draw it on a piece of paper and then you join the vectors head, sorry, tail to head, and then you resolve the equation. Other way is to, to do a parallelogram the, as, if you, as you can see on the right hand side here. All the assumptions are made that, so that, we, that the, the system is in equilibrium, as in everything is static. How we apply it to the knee? When you get this in the exam, they are expecting you most of the time to describe the patella femoral joint uh, free body diagram. The way to do it is you start by a knee, you simplify it by bending the knee to about 40 degrees, and then you draw the force, which is the pull of the quadriceps. As you can see it here, applied to the center of the patella. You apply the pull of the body resistance because the quadriceps is trying to pull the leg and the weight of the leg is against it. So you draw a line from the, the uh, previous point in the patella down the insertion, which is the patella tendon. And then you resolve the equation by doing the parallelogram or you can move this arrow up, you get the same result, which is the direction of the pull the, the, the uh, combined pull of both. This will be resisted by a force equal in quantity and opposite in direction, which is the joint reaction force. Okay, so this is a simplification of it. Moving to how we apply that to the knee. If we start with the bony anatomy, looking on the left hand side, you can see that there is a difference between the medial and lateral femoral condyles. So the diameter is different. The medial femoral condyle is larger than the lateral. Not only that, if you study it with a CT scan cuts, sagittal cuts, the left hand side, so the middle picture here, on, you can see that the lateral condyle has two centers of rotation, while the medial side has a very close two centers of rotation, almost like one center of rotation. So you can imagine in your head that when you flex or extend the knee, on the medial side, it is moving about one axis. On the lateral side, it moves between two axes depending on where it is in that movement between flexion and extension. And you can imagine, looking just at the circles there, that in extension, you are rotating against uh, around the anterior axis, and in flexion, you move to rotate around the posterior axis. And that has an implication, which I will describe in a second. If you look at this picture, you can see that there is a difference between the medial and lateral femoral condyle in that the medial is dished convex and the lateral is con uh, sorry concave and the lateral is convex. Talking about the soft tissue and how they apply to biomechanics, it's, I'm, we are going to put all these together into a mechanical 
uh, uh, model for the knee in a second. We know that the ACL and PCL play an important part in stabilizing the knee. So the ACL stabilizes it against the tibia against uh, internal rotation and anterior subluxation, and the PCL against posterior uh, uh, drag or subluxation. Uh, in addition, they play an important role in stabilizing the knee and in guiding the movement of the knee. And they have some proprioception uh, sensors as well. If you look at the menisci, the medial meniscus is larger, deeper than the lateral, and it is more stable. So with that, it provides more stability on the medial side compared to the lateral side. In addition, as you know, the function of it is to change all the, the, the vertical uh, stress into lateral hoop stresses, which they can absorb. We'll talk about the pobletius in a second and its function. So you've, the popliteus starts on the lateral side of the femur and inserts on the posterior medial side of the tibia. And just by looking at it, you can imagine that when it is applied, it exerts an external, sorry, a, a, um, internal rotation function on the tibia. Now, if we put all these together, so you've got a larger medial side, larger medial femoral condyle, more stable meniscus that stops the movement on the medial side. On the other hand, on the lateral side, you've got a smaller surface, two diameters, and less stable meniscus. So if you put those together, you can think of it as the knee is st static, so it's doing a rolling on the medial side. It's, sorry, it is moving along the same point on the medial side. And this is represented in this, in this picture here. So you can see that the point of contact on the medial side is almost static between flexion, sorry, extension and flexion. So the blue is flexion. So it moves little. If you look at the lateral side, the point of contact, the tibia, is moving posteriorly that plays an important role in clearing the knee deep flexion. So if you look here, imagine that the knee does not roll like that, you would have an early contact between the posterior cortex of the distal femur against the posterior cortex of the tibia. Because the point of contact is moving backwards, that, clear, that creates a clearance. So that's what sometimes they call it the posterior uh, um, offset. And this is because of the rollback. So, in addition, there is a uh, posterior clearance, as we mentioned here, and it stabilizes the patella. Uh, let's see how they, all these movements happen in real life. Okay. You note here that there is a bit of rotation at the end of extension. Okay. That is to do with what we call a screw home mechanism. How do we explain that? The same principle. So you have a wider surface on the medial side smaller surface on the lateral side. So during the first, uh, sorry, the last bit of extension, the anterior tibia glides anteriorly. This causes an external rotation on the tibia. Okay, and that, uh, sorry, internal rotation on the tibia. And, uh, Right. Let me let me explain that again. So when the knee is extended, anterior and posterior cruciate ligament gets tangled, and that gets tightened, and the tibia is externally rotated with respect to the femur. And I will explain that in a second with this diagram. As you can see, with that, with the external rotation, the tight, there is a tightness of both the ACL and PCL. They get entangled, and because of that external rotation, they become more tight. 
and that stabilizes the knee. In doing so, you are relaxing the quadriceps muscle that does not have to be tight throughout your standing, and that preserves energy. If we look at it again in this diagram, you see this is the rollback, and at the same time, you can see a bit of rotation there. Okay, moving on, this is important again when we apply it to the total knee replacement. We have to understand the axis of the knee and how and why we are doing certain things during the knee replacement. So again, this is basic principles. We are talking about the mechanical and uh, uh, anatomic axis of the knee. So the mechanical axis is a Point is, a, is a vector that starts from the center of the knee, of the hip, and into the center of the ankle, and that represents the push or the, the body's weight. The anatomical axis is one in the middle of the shaft of the femur. And as you can see, there is a six degree average difference between the two. Not only that, if you look at the joint surface, so if you look at the femoral, tibial surface. If you look at the right hand side graph, you see that the joint line is not parallel to the ground. It has a three degree elevation on the lateral side compared to the medial side. So if you work, if you look at it then, there is a difference between the joint line at the distal of the femur to the anatomical axis in the middle of the femur nine degrees. The application of that is when we are doing a knee replacement, there are two schools of thoughts, either to maintain the anatomical shape of the joint, which is three degrees to the ground, or to ignore that and go for the anatomical or mechanical axis and make the joint line parallel to the ground, but which makes it easier to make the cuts. So this has an implication again in the biomechanics. If we go further down into the knee replacement, and I will explain in a second why, we are talking about PS versus CR. So posterior stabilized and cruciate retaining knee replacements are, complete, are two different principles in doing a uh, primary knee replacement. And if you look at the left, you've got two uh, designs, one that has a box and one without. And the idea behind it is in the posterior stabilized knee, you are keeping the PCL and sacrificing the ACL. As we described earlier, the PCL has an important role in stabilizing the knee and guiding the movement. So that's why the advocates of this design say that it has a more uh, replication of the normal movement of the knee. On the other hand, the advocates of the other design will say, if you have lost one ligament, you might as well lose the other and then force the movement the way you want it by forcing the rollback me uh, mechanism through a cam post mechanism as described on this and I will show why. So in the campus design you try and replicate the rollback movement of the knee by having a post the tibia a cam that glides against it and in deep flexion 75 degrees the post preventing the tibia is forcing the femur through the cam there to roll back change the point of contact as you can see. So the point of contact here is anterior, the point of contact in flexion is posterior. That is to replicate the normal rollback movement and gives a better, deeper range of movement. And that is shown on studies to, to be uh, somewhat true. So again, if you look at this, these points represents areas of contact between the medial and lateral 
here you have the uh, uh, posterior sacrifice and here crochet retaining and you can see that in uh, posterior stabilized there is a more representative of, uh, of what is normal uh, rollback movement however in the new uh, design of the cruciate retaining they are trying to replicate that by changing the design to allow different curvature of both medial and lateral so they are putting more uh, radius on the medial side to try and again replicate this movement which is internal external rotation but at the same time as a rollback movement and recent studies have shown that this may have actual actually improved the uh, the movement. However, up to date, there is no long-term studies, functional studies, that showed any difference between the two. Moving to the sagittal plane, there is a concept called the uh, tibial slope in the net native knee, and this is a uh, measurement of the proximal tibial surface in the sagittal plane. There are different ways of measuring it. One of them is to measure it against the anterior cortex there. And then you measure that angle between B and C. And the normal value is 5 to 15. The function of that is to aid the ACL and PCL in stabil stabilizing the knee in flexion. So imagine if you have a deeper slope, which means the posterior side is lower, then you can think of it that the knee will push forward as it flexes, which means it puts too much pressure on the ACL. And again, the same thing if it's more horizontal, it'll put too much pressure on the PCL. So that's there for a reason. Having said that, when we do a total knee replacement, depending on the principle, you are sacrificing either of or both of these ligaments. So the slope very important to aid in the normal mechanics of the knee replacement. So if you increase it in, in the cruciate retaining, you still have the PCL, which stabilizes the knee somehow, the patella, uh, sorry, the tibia somehow. So the advice is to aim for a slope of five to seven degrees, compensate for the loss of ACL, and not put too much pressure on the PCL. On the other hand, in the posterior stabilized, you can go for neutral because you lost both ligaments and you are relying on the cam uh, and post to stabilize the knee on both anterior and posterior uh, movements. So you don't have to go for that, you go for neutral. Any, dif any bigger difference in that and it'll create a bigger gap in flexion. And uh, that increases instability of the knee. This is a quick whiz through the biomechanics of the knee. It's a big topic. Um, and as you can uh, imagine, it, it took a bit of time to understand. However, I tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, I've put some resources in these slides. I hope you can uh, return to them. Some of them are really good, and some of them you know already, like the ortho bullets. And uh, back to you, um, Dr. Gopal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanon, for that excellent presentation. Uh, biomechanics of knee has been made a bit more simple, uh, thanks to you. Uh, can you explain the long-term outcomes between a CR and a PS? Because we discussed so much about CR and PS, and finally we say that the results are the same. Yes, well, you would find a passionate advocate of either design um, everywhere. The, for the exam, what you need to say is, there is no clear answer of which one has a better long-term results when it comes to patient's functions and range of movement. There is some difference in some biomechanical studies, either on humans, cadaver, or uh, computer uh, analyzed designs, but that does not change into um, a, a real life results. And then, Whatever you do in your own practice, you try to highlight and justify, knowing that there is no clear scientific um, advantage. 
Having said that, there are certain aspects that people tend to use the posterior stabilized knee, which is when they don't trust the normal ligaments of the patient. So for example, in rheumatoid knees, especially in severe valgus, a lot of the surgeons will use this as the first go-to um, prosthesis. While others would argue that in a normal knee, you don't need to sacrifice that much bone because a lot of them will end up being revised and the more stock you preserve, the better, and you, you preserve the normal proprioception. So this is how I would phrase it for the exam. Uh, so can we say that a PS knee is a slightly constrained version of the CR knee? Absolutely. Uh, in, in, the, in the scale of constraint, the uh, cruciate retaining is considered after the unicompartmental knee replacement as the least constrained. Um, and then the next step up is the uh, posterior stabilized. Having said that, the difference is not significant as you compare it to a uh, hinged, for example, or semi-constrained. The, the, the step is bigger when you move to that. The scale is bigger. The other thing is regarding uh, kinematic alignment. Can you say in like a simple words, what is exactly kinematic alignment? We discussed a lot about it, but in mm -hmm. very simple words, exactly. Yeah. Kinematic alignment is called anatomic alignment, and this is the best way to remember it. If you, if you look at this slide, I've used the anatomic first and kinematic as between brackets, although commonly it's the other way around. The reason I use this, it's easier to remember. So kinematic alignment, which is anatomic alignment, what you do is you maintain the three degree slope on the distal femur when you make the distal femur cut. And the best way to do it is to start uh, to do the femur first and then to build on the tibia and just build it in the system okay so this is it and again the advocate of this system they are claiming that it maintains the normal uh, plane of movement of the knee um, having said that in, in the uk the common practice is to go for the mechanical alignment and although the mechanical alignment, they advocate, the initial advocates of it stated that you start with the tibia, but most of the surgeons in the UK that I've worked with will start with the femur anyway, but they dial the cut accordingly. So you lose that, these three degrees. That's, that's um, I think that, that is enough for the exam. And what are the outcomes? I mean, what are the differences in long-term outcomes? I'm not aware of any difference in the outcomes whatsoever. Um, it's the, the, again, we are talking about a three degrees difference. And in, in reality, you know that none of these saws, none of these jigs that we use, and even our hands are not that accurate to 100% replicate that. In, in, in fact, people say, aim for a one or two degrees, and wherever mistake you make, you will end up right. Because you've got a safe zone or safe range between three to zero, where you can do whatever you want within that, and, and the results are the same. The other important thing when, uh, I mean, that has happened in recent times is called a single radius knee implant. What is your take on the single radius knee implant, and can you explain about it slightly more? This is, this is a difficult topic. Um, to be honest, I haven't got a lot of experience in, in doing that. All what I understand is the single radius tries to make the movement move, you know, movement along one point of axis and try and replicate the role. The double radius is trying to replicate what's happening on the lateral side where you have one anterior and one posterior radius and that tries to push the knee more into the rollback and clearance on the posterior. So at least in theory, it gives a better uh, range of movement, more flexion. However, however, I am not aware of a huge difference in the range of movement. The only difference I know of is between the cruciate retaining and posterior stabilized. There is a, 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 something like five to 10 degrees in difference in deep flexion. That's as far as I'm aware when it comes to range of movement. Thank you. The and if you have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen because as I said, I haven't got a lot of experience in this particular design. Okay. Uh, the other one was uh, of a concern was something called as an axis of rotation in the instantaneous axis of rotation. We say that when, as the knee moves, the axis of rotation itself moves in a J-shaped curve, isn't it? Yes. 
And how do, how does that uh, correlate with all these uh, types of implants? Okay, so in theory, the implant that has a J shape, which is a dual, would, would replicate that better. But it's, the radius is only one part of the equation because you have the deep, the, the, the deepness of the dish in the patella surface, the tibial surface. You have the relative difference in diameter between the medial and the lateral. And you have the CAM or the PCL, which forces the, the knee to move in one position. And probably that's why whatever we tweak on one side, the body tends to uh, neutralize overall by doing something else elsewhere. And all the studies that, that I am aware of that have been done using cameras, using markers, with people walking with whatever designs, they end up showing that whatever you do, number one, you don't replicate 100% the normal knee movement, and number two, people cope to a degree. It's just at the extremes when you do something too much and too many small mistakes are accumulated that things go wrong. The bottom line is we don't understand the knee as much as we understand the hip and all the designs are trying to catch up and that's replicated in the in the NGR results. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hanun. I think that's all the questions that we, uh, we have for this session. Thank you so much for joining in us. No and I think this is such a fantastic talk and it's going to benefit really a lot number of people all over the world. Thank you so much for no being problem. with us, Dr. Hanun. Thank you for inviting me and yeah. looking forward to uh, yeah, Being to, to do again together. More, please, kindly. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.